All right, man, peace. Brothers, you know what? In life, one of the most important aspects or characteristics that you can have to your personality, to your being, is self-awareness. Because when you have self-awareness, you understand what your place is. The only way that you can advance and that you can move forward in life with a certain sense of reality is if you have the self-awareness to know what your current status is so that you don't make a damn fool of yourself. And someone needs to tell that to Mr. Carmelo Anthony, who for years seems to have a very inflated opinion of himself. And there's nothing wrong with a brother being confident. Brothers should be confident, but they should be confident within a certain framework of reality. When your ego starts to transcend that little framework, that box, all you do is make a jackass of yourself eventually because life is like a spring. No matter how far you stretch it out, it's always going to snap back. It's going to remind you exactly what the extent of your abilities are. If you want to improve on the extent of your abilities, you have to face reality first so that you can go about taking up that route, that road to improve yourself. And Carmelo Anthony has never been faced with those realities. He thinks that he's LeBron James, which is why he has not taken the time to improve his physique, to improve his conditioning, so that he can actually be the person that he thinks he is. And I've said this for years about Carmelo. He's a nice player. At best, he was good. At his peak, he was a very good offensive player. But he was never a great player overall, ever. But you know what? They're going to talk about it, and I'm going to chime in. And we also have the Carmelo Anthony situation. Um, look, they, this is how much money they would try to commit to Paul George. We'll talk in a minute about Melo, who is expected to opt in. You've got a bunch of money tied up in him. You're going to start having to make dif difficult decisions if you don't want to get into the repeater tax, right? right. For um, can you pay Steven Adams what he should be paid? Some of those other guys on the team that filled out the roster, maybe you can't do that. And then they're... Carmelo Anthony is hitting that phase as an athlete that I oftentimes talk about on this channel that many of these modern day liberal females hit when they get about 35 and they realize that their clock in regards to being a sex kitten is ticking. They're no longer walking down the street and having men turn their heads to look at their backside or look at their breasts. They're looking in the mirror every morning and they're seeing crow's feet around their eyes. That is what Carmelo Anthony is starting to go through right now athletically. He is not the bell of the ball anymore. He's no longer considered the number one option on a team that considers itself championship caliber. And that is very difficult for him to come to terms with because for years he's been considered the number one recruit. Back in the early 2000s, he was considered the number one player in college basketball while he was there for that one season. Then he comes to, into the draft and the only person who was able to overcome his stature as an incumbent NBA player was Mr. LeBron James. For years, he was able to ride the number two pick in the draft only after LeBron James bandwagon. And he was a very good player out there in Denver for a while give you 24 to 27 points a game, shoot about 44, 45% from the field. Never really had any playoff success. It was always one round and out. And when you see players like that, the only thing that that tells me is that number one, they're not a transcendent player. Number two, they're not willing to put in the work in the off season to become a transcendent player. And that's why I always tell you brothers, there's only four great players in the NBA right now and on my scale. And that's LeBron, KD, Steph, and Kawhi when Kawhi is healthy. All these other players are vying to add on enough empirical data and enough information onto their resume or into their dossier to get to that level, to get to that upper echelon, in my view. Because I don't just throw those terms around willy-nilly. Oh, he's great. That person's great. This person's great. It takes a lot to be great. You can have great aspects. That doesn't make you great in totality. And Carmelo has never been great. I'm not a New York Knicks fan, but I do watch them play. And before they traded for him back in 2012, I believe, is when they traded for him, 2011, 2012, one of those seasons. And I said, the Knicks should not trade for Carmelo Anthony. It's like trying to marry a hoe when you know she's not going anywhere anyway. There's no need to give her the ring. Carmelo was going to come to the Knicks regardless. He was trying to use the Brooklyn Nets as a bargaining chip to say, if the Knicks don't trade for me now, I'm going to go sign with Brooklyn. They traded a lot of pieces to bring back Carmelo Anthony, a player, a performer who has never shown that he could raise his game to the level that it needed to be raised to in order to get to the finals. 
And as you can see, anybody with foresight who's a three-dimensional thinker could see that Carmelo Anthony's end was not going to be anything that he was going to like. Because when you don't put in the work in the early part of your career, it's going to show in the latter part. As you can see, he has no explosiveness. And he, he was never a transcendent athlete to begin with, so that means he has to work harder than everybody else. And he does not do that. The alpha on Oklahoma City, Russell Westbrook, is probably one of the top 10 athletes in the world right now, no matter what sport. And, and he's the hardest worker. Russell's problem is that he's not a microcosmic thinker. And I'm not sure that that'll be something that he can repair or improve on. But Carmelo, to me, he's not even a starter in the NBA anymore, unless you're on a bad team. I'm sorry. Certain brothers may disagree. But if I owned a team, he could not start for my team. Therefore, you know, that team might be worse. And then here is Carmelo. And I just got to listen to this. I'm not sacrificing no bench roll. So you can, that's out the question. That's out the question for who, bro? I'm sorry, but you don't have any power to dictate anything. You're not good enough to dictate anything. So you have two options. You can either ride the pine and get that $28 million check. Enjoy that last year. Because after that, it's going to be hard for you to even get a team to want you. Unless one of your homeboys hook you up on a heavy discount. Or you can opt out and you can find out what you're really worth around the league. You can find out how you're really viewed around the league. And that's going to hurt you even more. So you have to ask yourself. Would I rather ride the pine and get 28 mil a year or, do I, or would I rather opt out and get my feelings hurt? It's up to you. And I'm pretty sure that that is what the Oklahoma City front office is going to tell him. You don't have any options here, sir. You're not LeBron. You're not, you're not Steph Curry. You're not Kawhi Leonard. You're not KD. You're not even Russell Westbrook. Hell, you're not even Paul George, dude. That's just the reality of the situation. And as a matter of fact, you matched up with Paul George back in the 2013 playoffs on the best team that you've ever been on, and you lost. You lost to him five years ago. So, just hypothetically speaking, barring that very gruesome injury that Paul George suffered, he was considered a better player than you overall back then. And I'm sure many people will say, well, Carmelo actually got a first place MVP vote that year. Yes, he did, but Carmelo has never been an MVP level player. Sorry. It's nothing personal. I just call it how it is in my view. I consider top-notch players, players who compete on both ends of the court. Carmelo has never competed on the defensive end, ever. Uh, as far as sacrificing, uh, fin you know, fin I don't even like to talk about finance, you know, finances and the, the, the economics of the game of basketball. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> don't worry about it. They're going to do all the talking. They're going to talk about the finances with you, and they're going to help you understand. They're going to, clear, they're going to clarify things for you, Mellow. And after they finish, I doubt if you're going to be so mellow. But they are going to throw that big bucket of ice water in your face to help you understand exactly where you are. If you do not have self-awareness in life, brothers, people are going to let you know what you are. All life is about is what you bring to the table, either to yourself or to others. Bottom line. And a lot of brothers have a hard time dealing with that because they let their ego get out ahead of them. It's nothing against Melo. I wish him the best. But there's a process to everything in life. You go up and then you come back down. When that time come, that time will come. That time coming real soon, brother. So this is interesting because if for, he is not expected to turn, out, turn down someone who's about to hand him $28 million. If for some reason he did, if he decided he wanted to go be a definite starter on another team, that would release money to be... Let me say this. If Carmelo Anthony were to opt out of his contract and then go sign with the Phoenix Suns, he would never be able to live that down. If he were to go sign with the Atlanta Hawks, he would never be able to live that down. Just for the sake of saying, I'm a starter. I don't think that he quite understands how he's playing himself. And beyond that, it's like, bro... You're 33 years old. You're at a press conference. Take the hoodie off. You know, elocute, articulate, project your voice. You're sitting there mumbling like you, know, like, like you have diarrhea and you're trying to hold it in. Like, come on, let's get, let's get it together. To be able to do what they would need to do to put a great team around Paul George and Russ, if he keeps it and he stays and they're that committed, 
and he's possibly discontented about his role in the team, Paul, what do you expect? And should he be open to a bench role? I think it should be open to anything. You know, there's no... That's Paul's way of saying, Melo, I got love for you, bro, but you're not who you think you are. There's no question about it that Melo is a starter in this league, but... Oh, he can start for some teams. He could start on the Phoenix Suns. He could start on the Atlanta Hawks, and that's debatable. Uh, he could start because of his name recognition. But I bet that if they had open tryouts, uh, I would bet that on the vast majority of teams in the NBA right now, he would not be a starter. I'm sorry. Uh, he could probably start on the Sacramento Kings. Sure. If you're the LA Lakers and you brought Carmelo Anthony in, would you say we want you to start over Brandon Ingram or over Kyle Kuzma? The answer is no and no. But is that the right fit? You know, I started my last year in Washington. Then I came over to the Clippers. I had a pretty productive season in Washington. I came over to the Clippers. I felt like I was still a starter. But Doc just felt like that was a great fit for me to start with the unit they had out there. In other words, Doc Rivers looked at you and said, Paul Pierce, you've been a valiant soldier, but you have enough accomplishments in your resume that you should be able to deal with coming off the bench. Not only are you a first ballot Hall of Famer, but you are an, MB an NBA Finals MVP, which is something that Carmelo Anthony has never sniffed a day in his life. So you should be able to deal with coming off the bench. Melo is still searching out that elusive NBA championship, and he does not want to be considered someone who tagged along to get it. So he's dealing with a lot of issues right now. Uh, his ego is totally out of control, and it's going to hurt him in the long run. Yeah. And so... You know, it just comes a time where you're like, you know, you could probably still start, but maybe you have to take a lesser role that's better for the team. And Look at Paul Pierce's face. Paul Pierce is trying to break it to him real gently. It's like somebody trying to explain to their child for the first time that the Easter Bunny doesn't exist or that Santa Claus doesn't exist. <laughs> Look at Paul's face. He's like, Melo, brother, you've been great for years. Uh, it's time for you to understand that that car is going to end up in the garage real soon. So pump your brakes. I think that'll be best for OKC. You, we bring Melo off the bench and you can just say, hey, you could just be a scorer. Because it just showed in this series when Russ and Paul George is out there without Melo, they thrive. The NBA game today is just way too fast. And when I say it's way too fast, meaning the top level teams, they, they move the ball a lot. So you have to have players out on the court that have very quick feet, long arms, and great reflexes. That is why OKC was at their best this year when Andre Roberson was playing. Because he has all that, even though the man can't even make a damn free throw. What he brings to them defensively was irreplaceable. Melo has none of that. He's a poor rebounder. He's a bad passer. He has terribly slow feet. He's not particularly coordinated. And he's no longer explosive. He can still beat his man off the dribble because he has a decent handle. And for the most part, he's going to be guarded by big fours. But after he crosses him over and beats him to the basket, he always has to regather. He can't finish smooth anymore. He's always pump faking. That is a sign of an old player when they're always pump faking at the rim. So, it's over for him. Yeah, and I don't mean this as a loaded question. Because it's going to sound like one. Can we, identif him. All right, can we identify something that Carmelo does particularly well at this point in his career? Well, he's, he's a... Yeah, bitch and complain. He's a great shooter. I mean, he, he is... No, he is not a great shooter. Stop it, Paul. Carmelo Anthony is not a great shooter. For the entire season, he's got nothing but wide-open jump shots, and he's bricked the vast majority of them. He's a 40% shooter for the season, and the vast majority of his shots have been open. So, no, he cannot even shoot well anymore, and that is a sign of his legs going. He's not, though, Paul. I mean, like, he's just not. It's just that in this offense, he was forced, when he older, he couldn't get by his man. He didn't get open opportunities. He was forced to play a lot of one-on-one -on -one basketball. If you get... Well, wait a minute. That's supposed to be his strength. Melo's strength is supposed to be one-on-one -on -one basketball. So how are you going to tell me he was forced to play one-on-one -on -one basketball, Paul Pierce? I know that might be your homeboy, but come on, man. You get Melo open and, and you set and picks and he's the that way guy. I was forced if to he's that, that guy, team. if he gets the shots that... Look at that shit. That man was chipping paint off the backboard that Kyle Corver and J.R. Smith got to where he had a playmaker finding him in spots. He, he's a knockdown shooter. And, and that's no question about it. He's one of the best shooters this league has seen. from three Nonsense. What Melo is is one of the better one-on-one -on -one elbow players in the last 25 to 30 years. And he has the, the nerve to say that he modeled his game off of Bernard King. 
who's probably the pinnacle of elbow scores in the NBA in the last 40 years or so. Bernard King is probably the best scorer in NBA history, arguably, in that mid-range area, posting up, facing up on that elbow, in that elbow range or on the wing. But when you look at Bernard King's stats, please understand that Bernard King was extremely, extremely proficient. He was not a volume scorer. Bernard King would average 25 to 30 points a game on 55% from the field. Look up his stats. Melo is not that guy. And no, he is not one of the great shooters in NBA history. He is a great volume scorer, great volume shooter. If Melo's averaging 25 a game, it's normally on about 20 shots a game, 18 shots a game. He's going to shoot somewhere around 43 to 45% at the most. From three-point and in, 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 it's just that he's forced to play a one-on-one -on -one game to where... That's supposed to be his strength, Paul Pierce. Where, you know, his one-on-one -on -one game isn't what it used to be. Well, he said that in that same press conference that he wasn't comfortable being moved to the four and that it didn't let him play the game that he wanted to play. How could you be uncomfortable moving to the four spot when you can't guard threes, Carmelo Anthony? You cannot guard threes. That's why they move you to the four, because you cannot guard threes. Quiet is kept. LeBron James can't even guard threes anymore, but because he's so excellent on offense, nobody cares. Hey, so it's interesting you talk about your move to the Clippers. Is there an argument, if you're one of Melo's friends, to say, hey, if you do move to the bench, you might be able to get into your more natural position and play the way you yeah, want to play? That's a possibility. That's, that. that's a discussion he has to have with, with Billy Donovan. You know, they... Well, here's the problem with that. Carmelo Anthony does not respect Billy Donovan. And this goes back to the delusional mentality that Carmelo Anthony has. Melo truly thought that when Phil Jackson came to be an executive with the Knicks, that he was going to be able to get Phil Jackson to come down from out of the front office and coach him. Not understanding that Phil Jackson does not respect you. He's never respected you. He does not respect your game because he knows what you are. No, he was never going to treat you like Michael Jordan and Kobe Bryant, which is who Melo thinks himself to be akin with. That's why I say this, this guy, Melo, man, he's, uh, he reminds me of that movie Shallow How with Jack Black and Gwyneth Paltrow where, where Jack Black is, is dating some big fat bitch, but he gets put under a spell so that every time he sees Gwyneth Paltrow, he sees a slim chick. That's Carmelo. Whenever Carmelo looks in the mirror in the morning, I think that he sees somebody that's not really there. He sees a Michael Jordan or a Kobe Bryant or LeBron James, somebody who's going to be considered one of the all-time greats and he is not i wouldn't even have mel in my top 50 players of all time uh, i mean if i was to make a list he probably would not even make top 75 you know they have to be on the same page you can't go into camp next year and, and just this awkwardness if if you know you call out the first five for pr practice and Melo's not in there right. this is something that has to be talked about all summer <laughs> and you have to explain to him why and, 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 and what's going to be the purpose of it but you know once again, this is why I never understood the vitriol aimed at Phil Jackson when he would make the very honest statements that he made because they were all true. And everybody knew it. But they wanted to point the finger at Phil Jackson because it was, it was almost like the relationship between the New York Knicks and their fans with Carmelo Anthony was almost like someone who married a chick who they knew that their family didn't approve and the chick ends up being exactly who your family told you they were going to be but you're too embarrassed to admit it so you want to blame the family for why your marriage didn't work that was the dynamic between the Nick fans Phil Jackson and Carmelo the Nick fans knew deep down that what Phil Jackson was saying about Carmelo was correct but they did not want to acknowledge it so they they chose to blame Phil and Phil has ended up being right on just about everything just about everything the only thing that Phil was wrong about was trying to forcefully implement the triangle offense in today's NBA and it can still be used in spots because even Golden State still use it in spots. It's just that, you know, Phil, he's like that old man who's a little bit too wise for his own good. He needs to go out to pasture and just chill out and go do whatever he does. But it was, it was hilarious to me that Carmelo Anthony actually thought that Phil Jackson was going to coach him. At 70 years old, however old Phil is, Phil's not wasting his time on your ass, man. You know, you know, this is something that has to be talked about in the summer because you know he's going to opt in. Can I can ask you a question because it's fascinating to me. If he got 29 minutes a night and it's okay, he's not in the player introductions, why is it so important for a guy to play those first six minutes when there's 48 to go around? Like, like, what, what it because, sir, he has no self-awareness. That's why. And he thinks of himself as a peer to LeBron James. 
not only in regards to the class that they came into the NBA with, because he was drafted in that same class, but he looks around at LeBron, at D. Wade, at Chris Bosh, who he considers his peers, and they have two or three championships, and he has none. So he wants to win a championship as a leader. He doesn't want to be that guy who is uh, winning a championship on a team where he's sitting at the end of the bench or he's playing 15 minutes, and his ego is run amok. And he cannot let go of the fact that the NBA has passed him by. The NBA has not been a league for a player like him in over five years. Well over five years. And the reason why the Knicks were so successful in 2013 was not him. It was Jason Kidd and it was Tyson Chandler. And J.R. Smith also happened to have the best year of his career. That's why the Knicks were so great that season. It had little to do with Melo. Because you saw what happened the season after that when Jason Kidd left. Melo has always needed an elite level point guard because he's not a brainy player. So the best season that he had in Denver, he had Chauncey Billups. The best season he had in New York, he happened to have an old Jason Kidd. Jason Kidd was in like his 19th season with the Knicks in 2013. So Melo is what he is. Uh, he's a nice piece. Uh, he's, he, he's exactly what they're trying to make him. He's a bench player. On a championship level team, he's a bench player. What is it symbolically about? I'm going to tell you for me. Yeah. It, 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 you've always been in that role. You know, when you go to the bench, it's, it's a different way to prepare. It's a different mentality. So when I went to the bench, it was just like, I didn't, I didn't know, you know, how my nap was different. My lunch when I ate was different. When I prepared was different. All that is valid, Paul Pierce, but let's be for real. Carmelo knows that throughout his life, he's always looked down on the bench guys. It's just now he's going to become one. Whether he was in high school, that first year of college, or in the NBA, whether he has openly expressed it or kept it within the inner recesses of his mind, he's looked at bench guys and said, these guys can't play. These guys are bums. So now at the prospect of him being sent to the bench, he's saying, wow, am I becoming a bum now? That's what's so difficult for him to wrap his brain around. That's why he's resistant to being sent to the bench, because he knows what he's always associated a bench role with, with being a bum different everything changes because maybe you come in at the six minute mark maybe you don't and so your preparation changes and your mental changes like when you're starting you know okay i gotta be ready at the start 7 40 i'm, I, I'm, I'm gonna be here in the gym i'm gonna be here I'm gonna, and that's what he's been his whole life so like that bench roll it can, that's like shocking to a player it shocked me <laughs> and it was just like i had to change my whole routine up and mentally prepare for that well i'm fascinated to see how this plays out because again if you look at the numbers for next year the Thunder are carrying an extremely heavy payroll that will have to pay a lot of taxes for a team that this year could not get out of the first round. Is ownership going to want to do that again? Will they have to trim back some of the support for PG and Russ and Melo, and therefore maybe they will have less of a good chance for next year? And plus, Sam Presti is in the unenviable position of being tied at the hip to Russell Westbrook, who pretty much has become synonymous with Oklahoma City professional sports. So what happens when the alpha on your franchise is not championship caliber? What do you do? You have to keep building him up, especially when he's a transcendent performer like a Russell Westbrook is. He's an amazing performer. He just is. That's why I always liken him to, to Sylvester Stallone in the 80s. You knew for a fact Sylvester Stallone was not going to win an Oscar, but he was going to make great action movies. When I think of the 80s, I think of a bevy of Sylvester Stallone movies that you know, you're not going to see nominated for any Oscars, but I remember them like yesterday, Lock Up and Over the Top, and of course the Rambo series, so on and so forth. That's Russell. So that's the real problem that Sam Presti has. He has a very bad mix. Very bad mix, and they don't want to admit that their alpha is not ever going to lead a team to a championship unless they get the perfect mix, and it will only last for one season. It will be like the Iverson 0-1-6ers. You have to hope that you can catch lightning in a bottle. Yeah. And maybe the way to cut some of that money, do you think Sam Presti says to Billy Donovan, no, 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 tell him he has to come off the bench and make him so, I mean, kind of pull Phil Jackson, make him so upset that he wants to walk I mean, away? Well, that's going to happen regardless. That's going to happen regardless. Either you're going to come off the bench or you're going to get upset, you're going to opt out. So we really don't lose, but you are going to do things our way because you're not good enough to demand anything. Managements do have ways of sort of uh, inducing the decision they want. I would tell his ass, not only are you going to sit the bench, you're going to sit right next to the water boy at the end of the bench. All right, we're going to hand you 15 towels. You're going to pass them out whenever anybody gets tired. That's going to be your job. 
and with about two minutes left, if we're down by 20 or up by 20, we might, we might give you some time on the floor. Now, do you want to opt out or not? <laughs> they want a player to make or an employee to make. Uh, look, I mean, Presti's been, been a pretty creative deal maker. Yeah, I mean, Presti's been a very creative deal maker and is great. Hey, I mean, no one had Paul George going there. They kind of pulled it out of their hat. So, I mean, I, I do like him to figure out the, the spreadsheet mechanics that are required to make everybody happy. But the, the mellow thing's huge. That's a, he's, I mean, I can't imagine him walking away from that option. Right. That's a lot of money. Here's what. But anyway. That's it on the issue with Mr. Carmelo Anthony. I don't really think that this is a controversial issue or topic, but it, it is going to permeate the Oklahoma City locker room going into next season because I'm sure that Carmelo is not going to opt out. He's not going to bet on himself in that way because deep down he knows that he's not a $28 million player anymore, and he knows that he's not a starting player on a championship-level team. So what he's going to have to do is ride that bench and it's going to bring a lot of poison into that Oklahoma City locker room. But we'll see what happens. Peace.